We've already talked a lot about coding standards in the last six sections. We talked about reusable components in the section about layouts, mentioned some approaches for making your code easier to understand in the video about functional primitives, and we've done a lot of refactoring and code restructuring throughout. In this video, I want to expand on some of those points, show you how to take your visualization beyond pure D3JS, and talk about debugging D3 code. In 2008, Bob Martin, the author of Clean Code, said that we spend 10 times more time reading code as we do writing it. I'm inclined to agree. As such, I think it's important to make code as readable as possible. The quicker you can figure out what a piece of code is doing, the quicker you can figure out how to fix it, where a bug is coming from, or simply where to make a new addition. So far, we've been making sure all our code follows a certain style, but we never spelled it out. Some of the style I picked up reading various D3JS tutorials and code samples. Some of it comes from my experience fixing other people's JavaScript. The style's basic tenets are use lots of white space, chain your calls, use narrow code lines, avoid relying on state as much as possible, and functions are better than objects. Let's look at some code from the previous video. As you can see, it's fairly narrow. Including indentation on the left, it's never wider than 80 characters. If you don't count the initial white space, the longest line is only 60 characters, and even that includes a lot of empty space. The 80 character limit might seem arbitrary with modern white screens. I think it stems from punch cards, but it exists for a good reason. Studies have shown that 80 characters is about the maximum length a person can read comfortably without getting confused. And if you look closely, you'll notice that these 16 lines of code form a single expression made up of many statements, each on its own line. We could have chained all this together in a single line, but that would be impossible to reason about. Instead of looking at a line and seeing what happens, we'd have an impenetrable blob of text, horrible enough to make a grown man cry. And besides, there's no reason to compress your code manually. We have minifiers for that. Now, without getting into too much detail, minifiers are used in production to make files smaller. They remove white space from JavaScript and make variable and function names smaller. The end result is a file that executes as normal, but is quicker to download. But if we kept the principle of putting each statement on its own line, why even chain them together? I don't know. For me, it's a style preference, but I think the practice comes from functional languages. In those, the compiler can perform a lot of optimizations with chained function calls, because it understands that the operations are working on the same data to produce a unified result. This way, it can avoid storing the data between calls and so on. And even in JavaScript, some of those optimizations do come into play. You can avoid the overhead of instantiating a bunch of variables, and hopefully, sometime in the future, we're going to get laziness and the associated in performance improvements. Certain libraries like Lodash and Underscore already do optimize some of those chains. But more importantly, you can see that all these calls are working together to produce a single result. You can tell at a glance that no other part of the code relies on or uses the partial results from this chain. Continuing with the same example, you can see we used a lot of function calls to set dynamic variables, but we never relied on external state. This not only makes code reusable because it's self-contained, but also makes it easier to understand. Each of those tiny functions relies on nothing but the data it is given. If anything funny starts happening, you can just print the data it gets and see why it's doing what it's doing. Problems with D3 visualizations often boil down to data issues. Furthermore, you can be sure that no matter what changes around this code, it will always do the right thing. This means you can move it somewhere else and still be certain it's going to work. Now, of course, there is the small issue of the visualization itself being a, a sort of state, but that's not too difficult to take into account. And about reusability, strive for it whenever you can. We already spoke about reusability in the Make Your Own D3 Layout section, so let's just recap what we've already learned. You don't have to go full out and make a layout every time you write some D3 code though, but you should think about assembling your visualization out of reusable components. You get two benefits. First, you can move your code around at will, change the order of drawing, refactor, things like that. Your code is more flexible. Second, you build a library of components that you can reuse next time you start a project. Why would you spend time writing the same code twice when you can just take some stuff from an older project? Another benefit is that self-contained pieces of code are easier to test and reason about. We'll talk more about this in the next video.
In his post, Towards Reusable Charts, Mike Bostock explains how to build reusable visualization components. You start with a simple function, then rather than taking a lot of arguments, you use a closure to bind configuration to your function. This way users don't have to keep track of both their argument values and your function at the same time. But now you have a function that is configurable only when it's first called. So your next step is to open the closure's internal configuration object to the outside world with getters and setters. To keep convention with the rest of D3JS, getters should be just setters without arguments. Given an argument, change the value. No argument, return the value. And if you always return the whole chart function, your code is now chainable. Magic! The last thing you should take care of is to take the selection as an argument. Do so and users have a concise way of giving your chart both the target element and the bound data. You can even make sure to react well to changes in the data. We basically did all of this in the layout example, then kind of forgot about reusability. Shame on us. But you should definitely think about visualizations more in terms of reusable components in the future. Another great approach to reusable charts that I found is using React. Now I won't go into it here, but if you want to see how that works, you should check out my book React plus D3JS. If you follow these basic principles, your code is going to be awesome and everyone will love you. Make it easy to read, avoid relying on external state, and create reusable components. But things don't always go to plan. Next video is about debugging your D3 code.